chat box. Okay, let's take a look at the chat box of so the conceptual design. Let's talk about all that's required to make the extruder work. Uh, I am sharing my screen here. So, for example, some images. Let's take a look at some Im images where we're at right now. So, if you go to photos or OSC filament extruder, I actually go into data collection. Oh, there's temperature records. <laughs> so just posted that <clears throat> but this is the current state what we've got is some issues like we're we've got two bands heating the extruder right now uh, insulated through this little shroud um, we've got one band towards the bottom by the by the nozzle and one towards a little higher is that the third one like the third one or so one and three Third heating element? Yeah, like the. Well, you're pointing out there as a he the cables to heating element and also a cable to a combustion. So the bottom one is activated by this one. That's the 230 setting point, set point? Mm, yes. And then this third one up here? No, the second one is right there. And the oh, second one? Right one? Above. So which one is this controller connected to? The two top ones. Okay, and is the second one, so let's call it one, two, three, four, is number two not on, or is that... There's only three heaters, not four. And two of the heating elements is connected to one controller. So two controllers control three heating elements. So a heating element on the bottom only is this controller here, or...? Yeah. And the two top ones are on that one. Yeah. So right there, what we're seeing is that with a set point of 230, we're reading at at this specific moment in time, it's 240. The other one is set at 230, and it's reading 244. That's that's actually close. Uh, I think the limit of yeah, but this is a snapshot. It didn't really state. It doesn't. <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't reflect what is true because we can't see the temporal evolution of this. Um, here we see the hot glow, which implies, I mean, glow starts at like 900 F, so that's super hot. Um, in this example here, this is when, this reflects some of the, the jumps that we have, like the set point of 230 at the bottom. Uh, after waiting, I don't know, like five minutes, this was five minutes or so, or ten minutes, we were close to the set point on the bottom reading, but on the top reading was actually much hotter. And how do we explain that really? How is the heat going down, uh, lowering at the bottom, and towards the top it's actually getting much hotter? Well, you, you would want to see that these two values are equal based on the set points. If we assume that the controllers work, mm -hmm. they should stabilize at, at the correct temperature. If they are not, I mean there is some overshoot to be expected. That's called hysteresis. Over time the logic of the, the it's called the PID algorithm, proportional integral differential controller system. That's what these little controllers have built into them. I don't know about the exact details of what parameters they're using within that, but if the algorithms are working, you, sh you should stabilize to some known temperatures uh, as set. Now, how long did we wait here to wait for stabilization? We could probably wait a little more and see, okay, what are we getting? But, given that the bottom one is stabilizing already, the top one should be doing the same, so there's some other effects coming into play. There seems to be a lot of heat transfer from the bottom heating element to the top thermometer. So our readings is based on what the thermometer is sensing. And that 
but the heat might displace differently throughout the machine. It might be harder at the bottom because we have a bunch of threaded bushings that, like a babushka doll, just leads down to the nozzle. Uh, we might have accurate temperature inside. It's just that just the reading gives us 226 when another one is 270. But when it tries to stabilize, we can get it around 235, 235 on both. But as soon as the lower one gets under 230 and starts heating, it will only gain like a couple of Celsius at the lower thermometer while mm -hmm. the top one gains 30 Celsius. Mm -hmm. So even as it, it's about to stabilize, it kind of runs off because how much heat from the bottom one reaches the top thermometer without the, the, the bottom thermometer getting triggered, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what causes a higher temperature in one, lower temperature in another? Um, what's the difference between the two ones? I'm seeing difference in amount of insulation they have if the tip is not covered and the and the upper heater element is mm. that would clearly but the thermometer is, is, is lodged about two inches above the end of the insulation uh, but yeah the, the lowest lowest tip is probably the coldest yeah yeah so if you have cooling on that one side yeah it will cool off so um, And typically the bottom heater element, the, the one on the right hand side here, that stays relatively close to 230, but then the upper one shoots up, shoots way up, yeah? Yeah. Mm hmm You will almost, yeah, this is just singular feedback loops for these two controllers. You would almost want them to somehow... For the top one to turn the bottom one off when it's too hot. But what I'm thinking is to change the parameters, see what happens if I put 200 degrees on the control of the bottom one, and then try to take accurate measurements of the temperature inside at the bottom. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the strategy for getting the heat to heat stabilization. So cover the, first of all put on end plug, add end plug. Uh, be careful about location of, uh, pay attention to location of heater element versus sensor. Um, I would say, uh, should we try to do to simplify things, start with one at a time. Don't worry about the second one yet. Uh, heating element? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we're doing right now, and I think that's a good time. Will it work with a single one? Yeah, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be a problem at all. It's just that it heats up less filament. It might actually be um, a, a good feature. Yeah, I mean, if we can do what with one, what it, it, it like, why not? Yeah, I mean, it's, if you heat more plastic, uh, those pebbles, you're almost going to get a higher flow. But for a proof of concept, you should probably be happy with one. Yeah, but we haven't demonstrated any uh, like consistent flow. Well, I have seen a little bit of consistent flow. Okay, so end plug. And also varied insulation. Uh, Removing low ring. So that's the plug. So where currently are we placing the 
probe. So compared to the heater band, where where are we exactly? See this works. I'll try to share it to the uh, photo to the filament maker document. Can I add it to that shared folder? Yeah, try to my phone. Uh, this is uh, the document is um, protected. Okay, should be editable. I see that there could be like uh, two approaches. One is we use an equation to determine the temperature internally of the pipe from a measurement on the perimeter. And two is that we use um, like a, a, a temperature, uh, some sort of um, internal temperature measurement device. Because otherwise, we're just getting the temperature on the outside. Right? I mean, the temperature on the outside could be 300 degrees Celsius, and the temperature on the inside is like 200, not even enough to melt the plastic. Yeah, it's it's iron. It should displace it fairly well. The iron? I mean, is the pipe, what's the, you know, the like complete material composition of the pipe? Uh, iron and brass in the end. Yeah, but it's it's not like it's isolated anywhere. It's all able to displace the heat. It should just take more time. I think. Is the is the pipe in the bill of materials? Yeah. So if you have insulation with any kind of R value, it, R value refers to how much you're slowing slowing the heat transfer down. If you've got pretty much immediate contact, immediate transfer through metal, as long as you're insulating it, 
outside temperature should be inside temperature on the metal. It's fast. One side of the one side of the metal versus the other, like a pot on a stove. You put a flame to it, it will get pretty hot on the other side pretty quickly, uh, pending the actual sea of electrons, the, the conduction of the metal. For less conducting things like stone or like rock wool or brick, it takes a bit of time, but metals are quite conducting. So if you're insulating, you can make a fair assumption that the temperature on the outside is going to be quite close to the inside temperature. How close do we need to be? Uh, we need to be like within like 5 or 10. Uh, we need to be within the safe melting temperature of any plastic. So, so, so if it, we've got, say, ABS, um, you know, say 230 or so, uh, typically the range before you start breaking down the plastic is going to be within, I don't know, like 30 degrees. Like, let's see, for safe melt temperature of of ABS it says 190 to 270 in fact the range is uh, quite a quite a bit you want to be at the most and that depends on the composition like ABS doesn't mean it's there's not one type of ABS you can have different kinds of ABS formulations depending on how the molecules are actually lined up uh, how the blocks within uh, ABS plastic are actually uh, composed like butadiene styrene block polymer is that's I believe what what that's about so it's like the size of those blocks determines the specific properties but you see the huge range like 190 to 270 well in our printers we typically went around like 230 or 240 for ABS, it's probably a good temperature, but it's like plus minus 10, that's perfectly fine. What you want to do is prevent uh, frying the stuff like we are right now uh, uh, by going way above those points, which we clearly did. So uh, here we want to stay within a, a few degrees for optimal melting. So, I mean, so the less breakdown of the material you get, and that means like breakdown means crowded building up in the, inside the actual filament maker. Now, um, what's to be said? So as far as insulation, like um, put a little diagram there, uh, the nozzle, we should probably hang the insulation down even like a little bit lower than the nozzle, but definitely around the nozzle and possibly a little bit. I have this thing kind mm -hmm. of making this cavity here where you're insulating as much as you can. All you need, I mean, you want that as much as possible so that uh, you're not leaking out. The idea is the metal and air you're radiating. You're radiating temperature away, uh, like through radiation, like radiant heat. It's not, not even conduction uh, or convection, which is upward con conduction in air. It's just plain radiation, like sigma t to the fourth style in the physics, what? where it's <clears throat> I don't understand. Uh, that's physics. But uh, there's a formula of how much radiation you get, and it varies as the fourth fourth degree of temperature. In other words, once you reach high temperatures, like once you start glowing, a lot of the heat transfer is through plain radiation. That's how radiant heaters work. Like a, like a fire, like in a fireplace. You'll see that uh, not just by the conduction of the, the heat through the air, you're getting that radiation, like the sun's radiation that burns your skin. Uh, it's radiation, it's not like you get, you're conducting all these molecules from the sun. There is no molecules, it's vacuum. So it's actually the radiation part. But there is a formula that says sigma t to the fourth. Sigma is a constant. T is temperature to the fourth. The so the hotter... Hmm? Do you know what the equation is called? Boltzmann equation. <laughs> is it? Okay. Does it come up? Yep. Uh, but the point being, like, there's a huge... S sigma... Let's... Sigma t to the fourth 
this is called a Stefan Boltzmann law. But the point is, once you're really hot, we are hot, like, like 200 C is getting hot. Um, that means at a certain point, the majority of the heat loss goes through radiation. But anyway, wherever you're not covered, the radiation is in full effect. You're fully radiating it. What happens? Well, the radiation happens all over that heater element, but if it goes into the insulation, it's trapped. It comes back. It's kind of bounced back. So that's why the insulation is critical here. You want all that heat to be uh, kept in, and that's how you'll, you'll equalize the temperature. Otherwise, you can clearly have differences in temperature like we're seeing right now is, is how I would explain the current situation. So I would do this kind of a thing where you're covering as much of the nozzle as possible, so only the tip uh, radiates outwards like an antenna. Um, the rest of it is trapped within. We've got this pipe insulation we've been using, or you can use fiberglass. Do you have so any got... gel? Sorry, never Aerogel? this time. It's not good. Mm. Do yeah. That? Oh, no, so no. that's that'll be for the insulation part. Um, if we're keeping the temperature in, we should get to the point where we set it at, say, 230, and you literally get an ooze out without even running the yeah. motor. Yeah. Uh, have we seen that a little bit or not really? Oh, we've definitely seen it, but not with the bad temperature. It's been way above. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we got to read. I would say it flows quite nicely, <laughs> uh, like when it, when it does have that little interval of good temperature. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about also the material. So the material we're using is actually is nondescript. I'm not sure what it is. I mean, it smells. It doesn't smell like ABS to me. Um, it thought it was PETG because it looked. Yeah. Yeah, that could make sense because that smell is not the smell of ABS. So, a material. Uh, I do know another material. We have we have a bag of black TPU. So let's maybe shoot for that. Maybe switch switch this. It shouldn't be as bad in terms of the fumes either. TPU is soft, right? No. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a rubber it's a rubbery material. So actually, yeah. that's pretty cool. It'll get you uh, well, it'll get you rubber film. It's hard, kind of hard rubber material. Uh, but we know, I know a bag. I know which bag that is, so we can use that. Um, with uh, the other thing about if it's PET. Or PTG or PET? I think it's PETG. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> whichever that is, uh, PET is actually highly hydroscopic, meaning it absorbs a lot of moisture, so it would be harder to work with. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe that's the thing that's preventing us from succeeding. Like maybe there's bubbles here and we're, we're bubbling stuff and not really filling the nozzle. The goal is to fill that whole nozzle with material. Um, and the thing is, it has to flow down, has to have enough residence time in the nozzle so that you get the whole whole tube filled so you get continuity. That's the thing. So uh, we definitely want to go as slow as possible on the auger once we're augering or maybe even like turn the auger, auger on and off, maybe even in like pulse it in one second on, one second off Two. or well because it, if we're pushing too hard, we gotta control the idea that we're not squeezing material out too fast, so we're actually emptying the chamber. If not enough is melting, because now we have this one inch, one inch auger, and <laughs> that motor is pretty uh, relatively fast there. Uh, so it's just a consideration. We have to be careful that if we're augering full force, that we're not emptying the chamber and creating air spots in there where you don't have enough heating. So how do you counteract that? Well, smaller nozzle hole, or what? Do you have like a potentiometer on the on the motor, like a yeah. sort of thing? Yeah, um, a DC speed controller. Uh, we have some that we can actually take a look at. You can use AC dimmers too, right? I think. An AC dimmer now. That's a DC motor, right? So we're running that at 24 yeah. volts DC. So the only way you can control that is by, for example, controlling the motor voltage, which we do have some power supplies with variable outputs. So we can possibly Dial do it. it. Or uh, we can actually go at, uh, maybe have two options, one in 12 volts, one in 24. 
but we don't know. It's uh, just speculating. Like, what's what's the real block? Now, in the in a precious plastic system, they do have. I mentioned that set screw at the at the tip, which allows you to control how much you're actually blocking the orifice. So, as far as how much will escape out the nozzle. We can rig up something like that, that means screw in another intermediate element where we tap out a hole and put like a quarter inch bolt in there or something like that where we actually control the amount of stuff that can come out right before the orif before the nozzle. With so that's another screw? thing. Hmm? With the set screw? So With a bolt, like if you screw in a bolt you're literally like closing off that, for, that hole at the end. Yeah. So yeah. uh, there's different things we can play. But the first thing, stabilize the temperature and see, see what happens when we, when we turn on the motor. What kind of flow rate? I mean, is it a thing that we observe that as soon as we turn on the motor, it just starts shooting out wildly compared to when, you just, when you're just heating it? So playing around with that a little bit, yeah, are we getting even. Yeah. wild ejection? So, so things to look for. So like. Let's talk at talk about um, like conditions. I mean, test procedures. Biggest one is the flow rate. I'm sure we can get the temperature stabilized. We can um, let's see heat stabilization and plug. Yes. Before we go into the ejection temperature determined by the motor. Where so where is our our uh, band heater versus the sensor right now? Uh, let's go down to the first down picture on the presentation. Uh, bottom heating element thermistor. Yeah. And there's one thing that's been moved. So Ink bird meaning what the? This is the controller name of the controller. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's below it. So the top white uh, rep wrap uh, thermistor, or the, the lower rep wrap thermistor, which is the second, the third heater from bo the bottom, that one has been moved to the tip of the bottom. So I've, I've, I've moved that around to, to probe it, basically, so it's not mounted like it is there. And what I want to try to do, um, I try to shake color fills very quickly. Is this? Is this the other rep wrap thermistor? Yes, but that one is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm using it loosely to probe around. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so what would you suggest? Um, try to get stable temperature with uh, changing the temperature settings, the, the insulation around. Also see if I can fit a heat, the lowest heating element even lower Ideally, you dressed around the, the nozzle. Yeah, why not? Certainly. That that should be the case, because you want it to be exactly where you're extruding. Yeah. That would be a good idea. Uh, but because yeah. otherwise, the nozzle, like if, it, if that heater element is a little bit above, whatever is exposed on the nozzle, you're just dropping temperature right there. Yeah. That's, that's all that's happening. And... Um, Temperature above that may be higher, but you want the temperature to be good at the nozzle because you don't want it to solidify. You want it to be the hottest point. Mm -hmm. Just like in a in a 3D printer, well, where is the thermistor? It's right next to the nozzle, pretty much close to it, and, and we still have that little sock around to keep the nozzle as hot as possible close to the uh, close to the thermistor. Yeah. Um, so maybe shift, <clears throat> so maybe here, heater band, try to go for something like this where yeah. one issue you've got with that this. Is that the last bottom part is tapering off significantly. Uh, so that the circumference is smaller than the heating elements are, are made for. So I'm wondering is there a filler material that conducts really well? Aluminum foil. Um, thermal so you want you'd like a yeah. I mean, aluminum is a great conductor. It's a metal. So you want to wrap that around it so that the band heater goes right on top yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Yep. 
Um, move heater to Okay, so that would mean and then put aluminum inside to fill in with aluminum. And where do we have the, so right now we have the, that's kind of how we have the thermistor. Yes. And then where do we put the thermistor hello. now? I mean, I'm going to throw it right above there. Yeah. Uh, under the foil, yeah, we, above the foil. We can put a uh, thermometer above the one below. That's it. So you'll go. I'll go like try to go at one, the tip of the nozzle and then. Yeah. One here and one like under the foil. So I'll draw some foil. Something like that. Yeah, I think I'll put the thermistor up below and ab above it. So I have a good gauge of what's the max temperature that the band heater, the heating band is, is sort of exerting in, mm -hmm. in the min minimum below. Thermistor inside aluminum foil. Yeah, but above, not to the side of it. Because uh, putting the thermistor right on the heating element, I don't think it's a fair reading how the pipe. So it's the, it's the temperature of the pipe. That we like above there? Yeah, precisely. They're probably under the foil as well, but yeah. Do you think this would be a good like use case for simulation? Like? Yeah, if you had the thermal analysis software, uh, this is not that easy, but you can. Uh, you can get baseline information. Well, if we like, I'm saying there's things like uh, the, you know the auger, the auger, and, and speed, and different temperatures, and there are all these like experiments we would need to run mm -hmm. to get like an optimal flow. Yeah. Yeah. And it almost seems like trying that, trying to to run all these experiments in the physical world would be like very, very difficult. Like yeah. Make lots of mistakes we already have. Yes, but it's I mean it's, it's almost the same approach as like a computer model, you know? So throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. Sort of. Yeah. But well the the is you know sometimes we'll damage the machine like yeah. we got we got all the melted the if, box it, it run up, if it ran off to 400 degrees like it did before, that would be a problem. So I don't have to take it all mm -hmm. apart. Sort of. Did you remove the melted stuff at the top? Yeah. Yeah. Is it easy? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the simulations would be awesome, except we don't have a couple of PhDs available in a month of time. Yeah. I think here we have a really clear roadmap on how to how to deduct all the impossible possibilities and how to sort of troubleshoot a thing at a time. 
because I think this is a good approach to try to get it. And, and then if the flow is not good enough, then I'm changing the other speed as possible, changing my nostril width as possible. But I do feel like it is just heating to the right temperature, and at that moment, gravity could do its work, and all the, the other does is help. Yeah, I mean, we, it was already system. through the nozzle. It was already, like, if you look at the nozzle, like, the pellets were already melted and wrapped around. It was basically already working, except it's too hot. Yeah, the extrusion was not quite right. Yeah, so let's talk about how can we vary. What are the four or five ways to vary the extruder push? Uh, auger Varying, speed. Yeah. Ben mentioned uh, also changing the nozzle to have more outputs. Yeah, we have like an output nozzle or something. So you can output multiple filament lines simultaneously. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's probably. When we can push through like four times an hour filament, that could be a possibility. Um, yeah, we can. Uh, the speed controller, like a speed controller, external speed controller. Yeah, or power supply. Mm. Yep. Um, variable power supply. Twenty four twelve volt power. Uh, twelve volt would probably probably work as well. It'll shoot more current. It might we have to be careful about overheating at that point if you do lower voltage, but it should probably work. Um, very auger speed through uh, universal controller on off universal controller on off can we activate that if that the only way we can activate that is by turning the power supply on and off which is which no not really yeah um, also it's going to create a pulsing motion yeah, if it's 24 volts, that motor takes how many amps? It's like two. What? Let's let's take a look at the power because that would determine whether the controller can do it right now as is. Because we have like two amps controllable, two amps on the universal controller through the actual, uh, like D8, D9, D10. They can be used to turn on, on and off rapidly. Let's take a look at the motor again real quick uh, to see what what the specs are on that um, what's exactly is the amperage oh 2.2 2 point two two point work up to 2.2 up that? to stall current is when you really load it down that load it down with a lot of force the current will rise at that point so it can rise up to 11 but normally when it operates it's a couple of amps if it's a 30 watt motor yes 2 amps at 24 means you're using like 50 50 watts so this motor is like 0.6 efficient altogether um, so you got 30 watt output you got about 50 watts in install conditions you got a lot you got like 200 watts 10 times 24 you know, like over 200 watts <clears throat> but if we could control 2.2 amps can we do that with a universal controller by turning it on and off rapidly we do have that capacity so what's the limit of the um well actually uh i did get some dc okay we do have some capacity that we do have some dc to dc uh, since we talked before I got DC to DC solid state relays, you can turn them on on and off like uh, probably up to like 10 times a second maybe. Uh, if we wanted to, we could actually pulse the solid state relays to control the motor like bang bang it's called mode like you're just turning it on mm -hmm. and off but not super fast in a pulse width modulation range of like kilohertz like super fast that you don't even see it. Um, so we have solid state relays that can do the rapid on off as in few hertz meaning like up to like 10 per second so yes potentially that could do it for the onboard transistors 
they're rated um, the heater elements are rated for several amps like for example if, if you have the 40 watt heater you're supposed to be able to control that with ramps in a normal sense like if you have a 12 volt system means that it's rated for like at least like three or so amps so we could try PWM control which is the you know how you have the 0 to 255 values set to how you can turn on D8, D9, D10 yeah yes you can do that and you can do a partial turn on like what's full like I forget if it's 0 or 255 I have no idea whatever it is you do a partial value like if you want the motor to run at half speed you would turn that value to say 128 and you're running at half speed but what it's actually doing is rapidly turning, turning on. it on and off 50% duty cycle so we have that capacity as well so we've got a bunch of ways to control this motor if we need to control it now we might find that oh it's fine the motor just as is it actually does a good extrusion rate and um, that's good enough because otherwise we're we're kind of like fine-tuning a parameter that's one more thing to fine-tune um, okay very auger speed through universal controller on off yes um, d8 through d10 can handle up to around three amps safely uh, I wouldn't say more. I mean, even though like there are, people are actually running like 10 amps for heat beds through the ramps, so but they tend to burn out pretty quick. So I thought you meant to put the D8, D10 onto a relay. No. You're uh, talking straight, 24 volt straight to the straight. Yes, with a, re a solid state relay, <clears throat> DC to DC. So <clears throat> DC to DC solid state relay. What's that look like? It's the same thing, except they look, uh, they have a DD at the end there. Mm. DD meaning you got input in DC, output in DC. Uh, so 5 to 60 DC. Uh, but yes, we've got a couple of these. So we can do this. And what's the. How fast can you switch this? Um, uh, let's Google that. How fast can you switch a solid state relay? Yeah, actually they're okay. They're up to 120 times per second. So we can do the, the relatively fine control of the motor speed with one of these. So one route is up to three amps safely but we know in stall conditions it's more than three amps so it's like not recommended uh, yes with S solid state DC DC relay uh, can switch 120 Hertz it's really determined by the zero crossing of a sine wave which is the current that comes out of the wall which is 60. twice per it's 60 Hertz but it crosses the zero twice per cycle so that's why the 120 oh. comes about. Um, so let's make a note of that. Uh, let's put a link to the solid state relay. So they're the same hertz, it's just that the solid state relays count what time it passes the midpoint. It's the same, it can switch, because it's switching off. Switching twice uh, per second with one. 60 hertz power yeah twice per cycle using yeah. 60 hertz power um dc dc relay so I'm just going to reference there um and you would think that like the regular ssr these regular ones uh, you got DA at the end, it's not DD. Um, DA as in for DC to AC. Um, 
you would think that they'd want to switch like why can't you if you can switch alternating current why can't you do direct current it's kind of weird but the way these work you can't you gotta have a special one so um, that will solve <clears throat> with these new DC to DC relays we should have an easier time controlling the relays from the reference board basically yeah, just like we're handling power right now from for the heaters, we can be handling power to the motor and actually switching the motor on and off. In fact, with the DC to DC um, heaters, the way we can be switching them, we can vary that through the universal controller. There's different algorithms we can use for how the actual heating is applied from just the on off on slow time time scales you can set, set that completely from how many ever hertz you want from like switch it once every second ten times a hundred thousand hundreds of thousand times per second um, so we have that ability to control the speed through this universal controller but if we go through a relay that gets spawn linked right if we go through Correct. If we go through that relay, we we just read the specs. It says you can switch it only up to 120 hertz. Yeah. Yeah. Could that be sufficient? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, 60 hertz, you don't see the flicker of a light, right? It's smooth. So yeah, yeah, it would be a smooth control if you've got yeah. access to 120 hertz or 60 hertz even. Um, okay. So we can control things here. Um, vary auger speed uh, through different ways use a uh, throttle screw that's what I mentioned um, block off the nozzle aperture uh, what's another way you can actually think about moving the extruder bit a little away from the nozzle like leave that space a little larger so you're not pushing directly against directly close leaving it farther up means you're pushing through more molten plastic that would reduce the force that you see at the nozzle mm. so that's another way to do it so move the the auger up and away from nozzle to reduce reduce push what else can we do we can uh, remove or add filament pebbles. <laughs> I don't know if that, but like the force. How that can would you? Build. If you if you had a lot of filament to be made and you filled up the whole canister, the weight of it would push. Yeah, but some control there, on. Like, yeah. On auger feed rate from hopper. Um, by adjusting amounts or adjusting total weight. Yeah. Uh, you can also, the thing we want to get away from is, I mean, we do have the nice round pellets, but the goal here was, see the ra nice round pellets, they kind of flow down the throat of this heater barrel more easily. They're smoother, right? They're like little balls. Uh, we can use those if we want to, but I mean, that wasn't the point of this. The point that would be good for testing, but the point of this is to show that we, we can use regular regrind, which is rough and could be irregular, and that this one inch barrel can handle that. That was the whole point of this. Because otherwise you're reduced to pellets, which are still a dollar a pound, though that's like a virgin material feedstock from the industrial supply chains. We're more interested in the waste feedstocks, which are 10x to 100x or 1000x cheaper than that. So. Um, throttle the throttle screw, moving the auger, any other things. We can add, I mean, you can heat the more you, the hotter the well melt, the more well melted the, the plastic at the right temperature, the more it's going to flow. So the temperature, it kind of, you can say that's. It's not exactly extruder push, but it is the rate of 
how fast you're extruding, that will be determined by the specific temperature you're working at. So yeah. the higher the temperature, it should flow more, but the higher it is, you're going to start burning stuff and it will start flowing less. So you want to get at the speed, sweet spot where the residence of the time of the plastic is not long enough for it to burn. So uh, you'd want to go at the highest temperature to get the best melt, but you want to keep it lower, low enough so you're not actually caramelizing this and turning into black nasty stuff so um, but we can say that temperature control and there could be notions of like the pulsed versus um, so there are notions of pulsed versus continuous operation uh, you can pulse the temperature certainly you can you can just get it up turn it on turn it off you can pulse it to make it rise gradually those are the control methods that the control algorithms use within the software whether it's the universal controller or the PID controller that we use and you can also do as I mentioned for the motor you can keep it on the whole time at partial power or you can control it by turning it on or off in discrete units. So those are the kinds of things we have control um, over for both motor and heat heaters and the number of heaters. But start with start with one heater. Um, okay, so we kind of covered how you control the push, uh, the end plug we talked about. Uh, start with one heater element. Vary the power out, power to the heater. Um, you, the only way you can vary the power to the heater is by using a different band heater. We have, I think we have a couple of types of band heater. I didn't really look at. Do, did you notice what power it is? Is it like 200 watts? I have no idea. Actually. So that's that's something. Uh, we do have a couple of different heaters. Uh, the set point temperature. Well, what does the power of the heater determine? Does it determine the max temperature? Um, not really. They both can get very hot. It does determine how fast you're getting to that. Like you just blow out through with high power, you blow out to the max temperature quickly. Uh, if it's high, higher power than not, you'd be potentially burning the stuff faster uh, naturally. If it's lower power, then it might just have marginal power even to burn anything, like as it's flowing through. Like if it's, I think these are like 200 watts or so. Um, we can get to 500 degrees Celsius. And two yeah. Minutes. Yeah. Um, we can actually. So in this, yeah. Uh, okay, so actually, just to cover, we can vary the power to the heater if we do a simple turn on. Oh, yeah, okay, this is actually, this may be useful. We can either turn it on, and it's on, just bam, full on, but all those D8 through D10s have the pulse width modulation setting, the idea that you can sw switch them rapidly. That's internal to the board. So if you do that, you have the 200 watt element. If you pulse it at 50% duty cycle, you're going to get 100 watts out of that system. So you can, in fact, control the, yeah. the amount of power on your heater elements for any kind of heater element, like whether it's a 200 watt, 400 watt, whatever it is. Yeah. The question so, is, how do you link that to a sort of series algorithm or something? Because if we lower it to 100 watts, that means it's going to heat up slower. That's mm -hmm. it, right? It should reduce the overshoot because it's getting feedback relatively faster uh, yeah. based on its heating speed. It would be so more inc incremental, yeah. More incremental, indeed. So, um, yeah. So here may be the case. Like we can't be shy about like okay, if we have to turn the machine on and maybe walk away and then come back half an hour later, that might be the the thing to do. Like I remember the. Well, I'm an extra. We had to wait for it to heat up 
until the temperature stabilized, it would go through a few of these, mm -hmm. these cycles. So that's just part of the game. Um, the startup time may be an issue. And that's the kind of thing that after we learn what happens really well, then we can say, oh, okay, now we're gonna, when we turn it on, we're gonna do it like in this algorithm, we're gonna like turn it to 50% power, we're gonna turn it off for a little bit and so forth. Like whatever we decide makes it approach the correct temperature the fastest. Um, it might be just all the algorithms already in the system already achieve that, but no, there's always fine tuning. You can always fine tune and and do things like oh what happens when you do now two heaters or however you know you it's always an interplay of how you how fine how much you fine tune it to how much you want to mess with it you can have high power but you need to finer control you can have lower power in there and you don't need as much tight control because everything is slower things like that yeah let's see so very power to the heater add insulation the material Let's switch to, you guys want to switch to the TPU, which we know what that is. Switch over to TPU, and it shouldn't smell like this. We, let's go with a known material. <laughs> yeah. And then melting range of TPU. Here I'm getting between 190 and 220 up to 260. So I mean, let's just do like we, we know that. The, so internet says 190 to 260 right here, depending on what. Once again, when you say TPU thermoplastic urethane, there's there's an infinite number of variations depending on how they they make the urethane. Urethane is actually a catch-all phrase for a lot of different materials. Mm -hmm. It's not just this one molecule, no. And if you have <clears throat> one kind of a TPU, uh, if it's a block copolymer thingy, it's made of blocks of repeating units, um, the chemists can vary the size of those blocks or how many of each kind of block they use. So, I mean, in general with plastic chemistry, you've got infinite ranges of possibilities. Um, for the actual chemical composition, therefore the properties will be a little different uh, depending on what you're working with. Um, yeah, barrel temperature. So like this I guess goes for like injection molding. Oh yeah, you can find nozzle temperature 180 to 220 front, center, rear. Oh, okay, so you've got some algorithms for for example, in a commercial extruder, that's what they do. They've got apparently here four zones of heating. Uh, so that's kind of when you get to the professional thing. So you kind of have this idea of preheat and then uh, getting warmer and warmer until you're melting at the nozzle. Um, but the idea there is you're effectively preheating, so you, you're, you can get higher throughput. So you got a longer barrel, you can preheat it. But with our short nozzle, I mean, I'm not, not sure if we need ever more than like one because I mean our barrel is so short it's only like 12 inches um, typically these kinds of systems are longer but um, they're saying 180 to 220 we should probably go around like 220 or so we want to reach the temperature ideally we would go we would flow the slowest possible so that we make sure that we're melting and we're filling the hole I think the biggest challenge is making sure the barrel remains filled. Because if we're extruding too fast, you're emptying it, and there's just not enough time in that short distance, including the, all that airspace that's in there. There's a bunch of airspace with these irregular pellets. Uh, so you have to overcome all of that. You have to have enough residence time that this just melts yeah. in that short barrel. But it shouldn't, em like, given that we have the heat hottest point at the lowest at the lowest, the hottest uh, temperature at the lowest point of the nozzle, the flow rate is going to be dictated about from how easy that falls down or flows through, right? And that's going to dictate how everything else moves to. 
because looking at it before, I mean, we didn't have a consistent long run, but the extrusion speed it seems to be, it might just work. The way yeah. It is. yeah, yeah, it may just all come out in a wash. We do also have another auger, which is slightly, slightly smaller. Like when we tested, it was okay. just slightly more loose, so it would have less push. And maybe that's what we actually need, a little less push than more, you know. So that's, if we talk about the pu film and push sure. force, um, it varying might be the case you push, don't need an auger. I think you do, but <laughs> it might be. If we had the parameters set exactly right, and the temp I, I bet you the temperature could do all that we need. Yeah, or you just, uh, the auger would just have flutes at the bottom two inches or something. Yeah, like something like work. that. Oh yeah, oh, okay, so actually that gives us two more ideas. So use a different auger, shave the auger, <laughs> shave flutes off auger. Yeah. Um, it might still be the same though, because if it's gravity does this work and, and the lower piece of the auger always has material, then the speed is the same. The other crazy thing is use a half inch auger. We've got those. Maybe that's all we need for push. We just maybe we just need like a just a little bit. Yeah, a cheaper or, <clears throat> alternative that would be just. Half well, actually, the the thing to consider is we've got that one inch barrel. Um, it could be that we reduce it to half inch and use only like use a longer heater barrel. That's hmm, here's that longer heater barrel just with heater elements and then the bottom part which has got the auger and even like a half inch auger possibly but i, I, I the idea of the one so half inch was it and then it would yeah. fall down into hotter and then you got an, an auger where the auger area so that's effectively like shaving the flutes off the auger uh you don't have any really any push where the there is no flutes on the auger yeah uh, but those are kind of things because the thing that i can observe right now i mean that barrel is actually pretty short for the the one inch, uh, one inch auger. Like it seems like all that mass. Uh, it's pretty rapid to to get that all heated up and um, because of all the volume of a one inch. I mean, having the full size of the auger also means that you get a little bit better heat transfer into the plastic just by mixing it. So that's uh, that's the idea. Yeah. <laughs> that's the idea. And the actual extruders, the professional ones, it's that the extruder action, all that force of friction is actually producing significant heat. Like, yeah. The auger itself? Yeah. Creates heat? They're high wow. pressure. Yeah. They're high, like, like the one you see on, even on precious plastic, you see they've got this big motor that's way geared down to drive their auger. So they're using it, they're doing it, what you need to do in things like, you need that force for injection molding. We don't need it here. Um, but yes, friction is, is real. Yeah. <clears throat> there's, uh, did you know that there's a thing called friction stir welding? No. It's a thing where they have this actual metal tip that literally mixes the metal. High pressure. It's you hold very, something against the metal. Right? It's a big, big machine. Okay. And it has huge force. So you say you want to weld two things together. It actually puts a lot of force on it. It has to be something against the back if, you, if it's like thin steel. Pushes really hard. It actually stirs to to get it hot to the point that it's actually Rubs welding. Off and yeah. So there is that kind of. So this, I mean, friction is no joke. I mean, you start a fire with yeah. two fire sticks, right? It, it, um, that, no, it, is that to not get any uh, skewing in the metal due to the heat? No, it still produces heat when it's friction. Uh, here. No, that or, friction um, welding. Oh yeah, it produces a lot of heat. That's what actually what's softens. The pro, what's the pro of it? It's What's the, why would, why would the pro it? is that sh that because you don't have the extreme heat of a spark, which is like millions. I think it's like million degrees. It's like really hot. Uh, it actually um, makes the metal much stronger because it doesn't have that okay. kind of weakening due to the wow. the crystallization that's associated with welding. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's that's that's like the high tech for like precision vessels and stuff that yeah. you don't want to blow up and stuff space age tech um anyway um use different augers yeah that's a that's a possibility there um 
if we have to extend the auger shaft, well, possibly take that auger. Like if we find that we're just not getting them out, we can't get the motor slow enough. No, we got to get the motor slow enough or turn it off to make sure that we've got the full barrel fill. But we might find that at the end, one thing I could see is that because we're slowing down and allowing the heat to properly happen, like the extrusion rate is actually ends up being really low, possibly, in which case the solution would be to extend your heat zone, lengthen the barrel, in which case we'd have to extend the actual auger bit. We could do that by welding like an inter inter stem to that auger, complicating we, things we could, further. He, 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 but we could add heating elements too, right? We only have that much space, so there's so we can. I mean, the idea is, yeah, you can put a lot of heat into it, but you need that heat to spread over the plastic. You have to have enough plastic area to. Yeah. Um, Are there versions of this commercial versions where the auger itself is heated? I don't know. I haven't. I haven't seen that. I haven't. It so makes sense to me that the actual internal of the of the shaft would, would be the yeah, listening. That. And you, yeah, technically, I mean, you could insulate the sh auger towards the motor and then just hook it up on each end to make it like a resistor or something. Yeah, you could make it into a, a resistor. <laughs> like you a, need like a hundred amps or something. I don't know. Yeah, you can you can do that. That would be a you can. I haven't heard about. I haven't looked for that, but yeah. that's certainly an idea there. Um, yeah, you need some sort of brush to heat it, like in a motor. This is spinning. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so what are the priorities? So actually, uh, when we go down there, we can go through and look at all the parts that we have, because then also is the controller of the wind, the the winder, the puller and winder. We have those parts there, so we can take a look at what we've yeah, got. Awesome. Um, yeah. So what's the priority in terms of okay? So for the extruder, stabilized temperature. Yeah, that's the first. That's first, the first thing. Big deal, yeah. And then we can worry about like auger feed rates and all of that. Then we can evaluate the feed rate, yeah. Yep. Take some data. Um, if you go to, <clears throat> so there's a placeholder you can find on my log, but it's the Aussie Film and Extruder. Uh, if you get lost on the wiki, what happens when you go to Aussie Film and Extruder? Yeah, you can click on 2110. Uh, data collection is here, so that's the first thing I put up there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, either notes, pictures. There's build pictures and video. Well, actually, I should add. So that would be the this. Build pictures and video would be the photo album. Okay. There you can Are add to it. Temperature sensors hooked up to the universal controller. Two of them, but they're in turn. There's not a feedback loop with them. It's just a reading. Yeah. Is there a way to read those values off the the Arduino? They are reading yeah, the are thermo. They are reading the, the thermometers, yeah. two of them. But the the, the rep wrap is not connected to the controllers for the heaters, so the it's just sensing. But well, the, the is sort of there a way to read the temperature from the universal controller? As I said, yes, they are already reading the thermometer from the universal controller. But if you want that to affect the it heating, wait, right? I thought the I thought the the, um, the thing that displays the LED of the temperature. I thought yeah. that was also measuring it. Yeah. Are you saying there's it is. So there's four thermometers, two from those two uh, uh, separate controllers and two from the rep wrap. But only the separate controllers are connected to the SSR. This whole thing is. Really. So only the, the separate co external controllers are actually affecting the, the wattage that comes into the heat. Okay, I'm yeah. interested in capturing the data from the. Yeah, we should definitely try to port it over to the rep wrap. Capture so the data and then uh, make a graph or like plot something in Python that's like here's the temperature over time. Yeah. Yeah, if we can get that and, and also Yeah, I mean a useful function would be okay, here's time measurement, one minute, thirty seconds, whatever, data point. Yeah, it's a graph, nice graph of how this behaves. That's the kind of stuff we should be getting to make this uh, more understandable. I can program that today. Yeah, you just hook it up to the rep wrap and, uh, and it's working again, so. You can, uh, you mean in Marlin or like in a controller? Do I mean, I could either do it in Marlin or override the Arduino programming. I'm not sure, do we need 
is Marlin doing anything? Or can I just well, it's supposed to. Can well, we have the temperature reading and activation of the various pins, like D8, D9, D10, which we were, we're going to use for controlling the elements. So that part is useful. Uh, but beyond that, to uh, actually capture the data, yeah, that, that's an addition that could be added to. It would be really to. interesting to have those curves, but to incorporate that into RepRap as like a algorithm-based solution, or like to make it uh, the history uses to sort of overshooting and undershooting, to even that out through the RepRap, I don't understand how we can do it, because that's G code more than keep firmware. There's um, no room for there's So within... Within a temperature control algorithms in configuration H, you can actually set some of the parameters for how yeah okay so how the temperature gets measured yeah and that's part of the firmware but not the G code so that we we can use feedback loops if just relying on the modern firmware right yeah so if you can find a way to capture the data with the modern firmware still on it it's probably be better and then we assign the thermometer as if it's the bed heater or something and then make that reading turn on and off. Yeah. That's what we would like to do. All right. Um. I was so interested in trying to program like a graphical representation for the web wrap control, like you know, it's got it's like oh, we can program like a different uh, GUI for it. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can do that. That's it's all doable. You have to study how that's done. Yeah. I but that would be that would be a cool thing. Like you know, for each of these devices, you have okay. Now you got your dedicated. GUI for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The thing for me that I still don't understand is uh, like I I feel like I'm still blocked on like the wiring. Like I don't want to wire up something that has a lot of different uh, connections with different voltages. Something still hasn't like clicked for me. In, like, in, like in fact, they use AC, DC, 24 volt, 5 volt, or, or what do you? Well, there's electricity. But then there's also like the physical wiring aspect. I understand somewhat electricity, but the leap to like yeah. But I can I can I can tell you how everything is wired and explain to you how it's working. Unless you already know. So. No, but if that helps, I I I've worked with it sufficiently to know <laughs> all the pertinent wires. So. But like, Martian, is is it's like to, is KiCad ever useful for like programming out like like if I want a visual representation of the wiring of a whole system, would I use KiCad for that, or is yeah. there something else like? That's just at the circuit level, not like for systems. But it does the same thing, right? You could do a PCB for any machine wiring. Yeah, yeah. you can, but it's like a PCB. Yeah, I mean, but it's kind of a. For KiCad, it's kind of a crude representation of it because it's kind of hard to represent all those elements. You can, but it's a, it's a basic diagram. It's very useful for when you have, okay, here's a PCB for the RepRap controller. Uh, but once you get a bunch of things interconnected, that's more like diagramming software. Yeah, it's like, like what? diagrams. Like, draw, draw, draw. I mean, there's the, the one diagram, thing that so exists out there is called fritzing. Is it open source? Yeah. Fritzing is used for decent diagrams of of electrical. How, how do I fritzing? Fritzing with a Z. And you'd recommend that over like using keypads and. It depends what you're doing. If you're doing the actual technical design of a circuit, like for example the ramps board itself, you put that into into keypad. If you want to show how the the ramps is connected to your LCD to your steppers. To your printer heaters and stuff, that it's like fritzing or diagramming software. Well, I would say. What do you recommend? Fritzing I, or diagramming? I mean, fritzing, fritzing is useful because it's low entry level curve for usage. You basically like drag and drop stuff in there. It's got a lot of library parts. But like in our workflow, you know, we're say working on our dock. It's like, well, you know, we're just just ending up drawing a, a lot of stuff in just docks. But it would be useful to to pull out all those part libraries from Fritzing because it's got symbols and graphics for all the different elements that you want to use. Yeah. Would you use that for the CV controller? Um. 
in a way but but once again at that point when you have specialized components like if we were for example using that rotary switch i like using the diagrams because i can show the actual picture of the actual component which fritzing may not have that component like fritzing will be more generic okay but i, I could try and figure out how we can integrate but you can add those library parts like to fritzing okay say we got that rotary switch there yeah you put that into as a library part meaning you you like uh, write down how it connects and put a you know a graphical image of it in there to create a library part in fritzing can, I, can you make any like ecad pcb uh, fritzing uh, element Fritzing will not allow you to do all the variation that KiCad has. The KiCad is good for actual layout. Like it will take take what you design and actually lay it out for you. Pretty it, much. It automatically. automatically designs the pathways for. Pretty much. Uh, you might have to do some variations, some little changes, but yes, that's the beauty of it. You don't have to mess around. Oh, how are you going to actually lay this out? You give it the actual symbols. Here's a resistor. Here's the microcontroller chip. Here's your voltage regulator. It will make those connections for you, and that's the use of it. It's it's CAM. It's like CAM, computer aided manufacturing for circuits. What like uh, PCB art. Go ahead. <laughs> you can. Uh, for that, maybe you just go into frit fritzing. That that will probably do that better. Hmm. All right, so let's, let's go down there.